We are now moving into a, a sector focus, the energy sector. And as we all know, energy is fundamental for all developments and our societies are increasingly depending on these resources, be it the natural resources themselves or uh, the converted uh, electricity. Um, but what we also know is that natural uh, resources are not equally distributed over the world. Some have plenty, others uh, can't uh, and necessarily must import uh, these uh, products. Okay, okay. <laughs> Is it okay now? <laughs> um, so energy transactions are indeed increasing. Uh, it may be connected to the trading of the commodity, or it may be uh, connected to production or uh, infrastructure facilities. Dispute resolutions, risk controls, becomes very essential, can be connected to war and terrorism, can be for sure connected to different policy changes which we have experienced over time, uh, breaking up monopolies, increasing liberalization, the green transition from fossil fuels to uh, renewables, and of course, uh, changes in the law and conditions for the concessions. Therefore, also energy disputes are arising, and this is the topic of this session. We have four presentations with five speakers. We have one and a half hours to go before uh, lunch break. And um, I'll recommend that first we'll listen to all four, uh, actually five speakers, and that you take notes whenever you find something that will be interested to have uh, elaborated upon at the end. So therefore, I would very much like to present the first speaker, Libin Chung, yes. who is Deputy Director of Peking University, uh, where you have a special institute on energy law and policy research, and you're also a partner of Broad and Bright. You will talk on China's Belt and Road project, and strategy and dispute resolutions in the energy sector. Please Thank take you. the floor. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, Anita, for the uh, presentation, uh, for the introduction. And uh, I would like to uh, uh, go through briefly my slides. And given the time limitation, I would just uh, probably talk very briefly. But if you're interested in more details, we can discuss later. And uh, also, I can share my slides with you. Okay. The um, energy disputes has becoming a very hot topic these days. You know, uh, in uh, every, you know, from very pers various perspective, both for academic and as well as pr practitioners. Okay, the uh, most of China's you know Belt and Road transactions are energy related. You know, uh, China is buying you know uh, crude, oil, crude oil and uh, LNG offshore and uh, through the pipelines. Uh, also, the uh, renewable energy products are also being exported. Uh, you know, so. The there, you know, the, the Belt and Road transactions are mostly energy related. That's that's for one. But if you look at those, you know, uh, situation in those Belt and Road countries, you know, these are the words which come to our mind. You know, uncertainty in geopolitics, legal environment, uh, you know, not ideal political situation, unstable, terrorism and local corruption. So we're facing the uh, question: Is is there a rule of law there or a rule of jungle? So that is pretty much a. Uh, you know, facing China when China is implementing the OPOR initiative. The uh, energy industry could be the single largest user of international arbitration, quoting the word of, you know, uh, you know Doug Bishop. The, uh, if you look, you know, know the history of the oil and gas, you know, from the very beginning in the last century, uh, originally, you know, there's a fight between the IOCs and the NOCs regarding the resources, you know, uh, under the concession agreements. And then there's, you know, renegotiating in the 1950s, and then with OPEC, and, and you can read a book by Daniel Jurgen's book called The Price. And um, with the uh, China 
uh, uh, NOCs uh, becoming, you know, uh, investor outbound acquiring assets from overseas in China as an NOC bec uh, also become an IOC actually, you know, when they're going out outbound for buying the oil and gas. Recent years, you know, uh, China policy is um, switching from coal to gas as, you know, a part of the uh, policy for getting green and uh, clean energy. China is buying more LNG, you know, from overseas. And uh, the, uh, over the world market of LNG actually uh, has some new changes. You know, the liquidity is becoming more and the prices are getting lower. So China is expecting to buy more LNG uh, uh, both based on the long term, you know, the sales and purchase agreement as well as with the uh, spot, you know, transactions. So um, this uh, SPA is very popular these days. Um <coughs> Domestically, China ha is, you know, in, in, you know uh, embarking on the uh, reform in the oil and gas sector, uh, you know, uh, throughout the industry chain. And I myself is involved in the uh, advisory group for Chinese government regarding the reform. Basically, you know, based on what is being announced in uh, May last year, China will break up the uh, monopoly in the oil and gas sector for the upstream and downstream, but the midstream China will separate the CMPC pipelines and becoming independent and uh, also uh, setting up rules to regulate them. Uh, the power sector is also undergoing uh, further changes by uh, liberalizing the, uh, the sales sector for the power. And I, I, I look to that, you know, as to China, you know, have more changes, you know, very, uh, you know, so in the future. So <coughs> we'll, we'll see what happens. But, you know, uh, the breaking up of the monopoly and also uh, having more parties to access the market um, also will cause more disputes. You know, uh, this will happen very often in the, uh, you know, mineral rights, you know, um, uh, granting and assignment, you know, uh, disputes. The um, for the um <coughs> the uh, arbitration in China regarding these disputes, I would say that you know uh, the judges and arbitrators sometimes lack the expertise in in these areas, and so I think that it's really challenging for us. Uh, China will also utilize more natural gas and buying more uh, you know uh, LNG, and I think that uh, given that you know the uh, projects in in this LNG sector for the infrastructures is more. Uh, linked to each other, I think any you know um, you know uh, disputes or breaches of contracts along the industry line will give more rise to disputes. And I think that that's something I will expect to happen. The um, the reason for many disputes in China in the energy sector is because that this is an industry where the prices fluctuate you know very rapidly. Uh, people uh, involved in the transaction take the opportunist you know attitude. This is also a sector which is, you know, subject to a lot of policy changes. SOE have monopoly, you know, government sometimes play a big role in it, and the court is under influence, you know, uh, for decisions. And the laws is, is falling behind, uh, doesn't give any certainty to the guidance of the resolution of the disputes. There's also the tension between arbitrators and courts. Although recently we see the positive change, as Helena may have pointed out, that the court is becoming more supportive. Okay. Internationally, you know, we will see that you know, um, the as China, you know, um, having a big, you know, uh, inv investment overseas, um, when it, when it, when the prices goes down and then the profit doesn't turn out to be good, I expect that there will be more disputes coming up. Okay. So uh, we'll see. Okay. That's what I expect. But what are the issues specific to energy dis disputes? First of all, let's talk about the uh, jurisdiction issue. The, um, the energy disputes very often arise with the whole state. And, and, and the whole state often have changes of laws and regulations and policies. So what China can do first, very often, as it happens in real, uh, society, in real life, is that China will actually you know, resort to um, you know, dipl diplomacy means to resolve the, the, the problem. And what that's what we call the energy diplomacy. But that's not really enough, actually, because you know, uh, it is there is much uncertainty in that. So by legal means, I think China should more look towards the investment arbitration. And for the, uh, there are some statistics in here that you know, the Washington Convention 
uh, between 1972 to uh, 2012, 40% of the cases registered in, you know, ICSID are actually, you know, the energy related. And in 2014, 35% of the all ICSID cases are relating to oil and gas and mining disputes. So really the statistics shows that actually, you know, for the investment arbitration, a big percentage of disputes are energy related. But unfortunately, China has signed many uh, BITs which are not updated yet to the second generation. And there are recent cases where the first generation of BITs actually has deprived Chinese you know, parties not being able to have access to the jurisdiction of the exit. And we see that you know, the uh, cases you know, uh, having different views pointing to different directions. The uh, Xi Yap Shun versus Peru, Senem, versus Lao and the Beijing Urban, Ur Urban Construction Group versus Yemen, uh, the court, uh, the tribunal holding the liberal view, reading that, you know, the, uh, the BIT, although saying that they only hear disputes regarding the compensation amount, but reading it more broadly, also cover the disputes over the compensation, the, the disputes over the expropriation. But also we look at, you know, the other case like Heilongjiang, where, you know, the tribunal held led by uh, you know, uh, Chief Arbitrator Peter Tomka holding a narrow view. So this is really, really not very, uh, you know, s uh, certain. So I think that what, what should be done is that China should, you know, more upgrade its uh, BITs and trying to make clear as to the uh, accessibility to those, uh, you know, uh, ju jurisdiction of the exit. The, um, the, with certain exceptions, Chinese SOEs should try to make sure that they have the standing of these investment arbitration. And uh, by this, I mean that, you know, they should try to not to hold themselves out as agent of the government, but really as a national of another contracting state. Otherwise, they wouldn't have the standing to bring, you know, uh, claims under the exit uh, you know <coughs> procedures. But this is going to be a double-edged sword. While you're making use of the exit, uh, you know, forum, by having a standing, you lost the uh, defense of, you know, uh, re resorting to the uh, state, you know, sovereignty or a crown uh, sovereignty as a defense. And this is shown in the case TMB Refuel Services uh, versus China National Coal Group Corporation, in which the Hong Kong Court of First Instance did rejected defense of the crown immunity. <coughs> I wouldn't go to the other case of Hua Tianlun, which. Uh, also uh, discuss this case, where the uh, court also reject the, uh, the crown immunity. <coughs> As to the other side of the, uh, the transactions for OBR uh, investment, you know, um, uh, when you're dealing with uh, the host country government or the NOCs, Chinese investors should first try to make sure that the other party waive the sovereignty immunity. The general rule of the uh, sovereignty immunity is that it's going to be in place unless it is waived explicitly. And I think probably in U.S. law is that, you know, as long as the other party is, you know, the uh, uh, conducting commercial activities in the U.S., and then that also is becoming an exception of the sovereignty immunity. And so this is an issue of domestic law. But nevertheless, you know, the, um, you know, in transactions, I think parties should rely on the contractual language to see c the waiver of the sovereignty immunity from the other side when you're dealing with NOCs. In the transaction which I handled for a client in investment in Uzbekistan, a Central Asian country, the, uh, the, 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 the typical president of uh, a production sharing contract regarding the arbitration uh, <coughs> clause um, reads like this when it comes to the waiver of the sovereign immunity. It says that you know the um, the uh, Republic of Uzbekistan, in the person of the authorized body, irrevocably waive their sovereignty immunity immunity with respect to the provisional security for claim and execution of judgment and or enforcement of arbitration awards. Okay, so this is exactly the the thing which we'll need in uh, in the contract. The next issue about the uh, energy disputes. Uh, from the practitioner's perspective is that, you know, we have to be careful as to, you know, uh, those two things when we're drafting the arbitration clause. First thing is about the place of arbitration, okay? In one uh, project which I handled in, in Africa, in Chad, you know, when we come to the place of arbitration, you know, we have to make sure that Chad 
you know, whether it's a, a judiciary system is supporting arbitration because they can set aside the arbitration awards if we accept local arbitration. The, uh, the, the research is that China has no BIT with Chad, although Chad joined the Washington Convention in 1966. Um, we should also, you know, uh, you know, decide whether we accept the so-called uh, CCJA, uh, um, the arbitration established by this, you know, a convention called uh, Cour Commune de Justice et Arbitrage, which is established by OHADA, a regional convention among 17 African states, which are former French colonies, including Chad, which is a member of New York Convention. Okay. And the, 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 no one hears about, no one knows about CCJ, and we have no experience with that. And, uh, and also CCJ is also a combination of judiciary, you know, a regulatory body, as well as arbitration institution. So I don't know how, 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 how they can play out the role of the supervision over its own arbitration awards. So based on these uncertainties, you know, I think our advice to the client is that we still resort to ICC arbitration in Paris, not accepting CCJ arbitration in Chad. The uh, typical arbitration clause is like this, where you, know, you still choose you know, ICC arbitration by three arbitrators assigned in accordance with ICC rules. The dispute shall be conducted in English. Place of arbitration shall be in Paris, pa uh, France. Decision shall be final and binding on both parties. This is a typical language we include in the African deals. <coughs> Another issue uh, which is specific about energy you know, disputes is that very often in energy transaction documents, the parties like to draft a, 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 a system, a, a, you know, mechanism which is called a multi-tier dispute resolution. The first one is a, like, you know, a amicable discussion, then within a certain number of days, and if it failed, and then go to arbitration. Uh <coughs> In one uh, arbitration case, which I participated as expert witness in London, the, the clause is saying, well, the first ap uh, amicable ap uh, dis discussion, and then uh, if parties agree to CTAC, and then they will go to CTAC as a first you know, uh, choice. If they don't agree with CTAC, and then they'll go to you know, uh, ICC arbitra uh, no, arbitration in London. So sometimes these are things which we call the agreement to agree as to how much they can be enforceable is questionable. And also as to whether those amicable discussion as a pre-arbitral steps, whether they are jurisdictional condition present to the arbitration, different domestic law you know, countries hold different views. US and Switzerland you know, uh, find that failure to meet the pre-arbitration steps does not deprive the arbitration you know, uh, jurisdiction uh, from the tribunal. Well, you know, the Singapore actually is saying, well, you know, uh, those are the things which, uh, you know, have to be respected. You know, the conditions is, you know, is a condition present, and if they are not met, there's no jurisdiction by, by the arbitration tribunal. So, so that, I think, you've got to be careful as to where you're going to and what are the, those countries' domestic laws attitude towards the pre-arbitration steps as condition present to arbitration. I wouldn't go to details of the, uh, the uh, price review uh, clause in the uh, LNG sales and purchase agreement because this is more complicated. It has even more you know, uh, you know, important decision on the conditions present to the access to arbitration because you know, uh, the, the condition which is built in to trigger that price review, uh, review is even higher. It has to be events beyond the control of the parties have to be you know significant significant changes and has to be you know uh, uh, you know uh, <coughs> you know the uh, something um, which uh, you know the either party may, re may request price review or special price review as set forth below based on an existing arbitration clause and the problem with China right now is that China mostly uh, the uh, the the LNG SPA doesn't have price review clause and there is no basis to start such you know. Uh, uh, you know, uh, arbitration review, you know. So, so really, I think that this is something that, you know, China should be careful when, the, uh, when they negotiate the uh, new SPAs, they should in include these, you know, uh, price review clauses. Of course, you know, India has some successful case where, you know, absence of the uh, price review clause, they can resort to the uh, commercial arbitra uh, negotiation uh, based on the um, uh, other commercial terms. But then that's, that's not legal, that's, that's commercial based. <coughs> um, 
Another issue relating to energy disputes is about the selection of arbitrators, and I think that uh, you know the uh, uh, the previous speaker talked about the uh, difference of civil and uh, common law distinctions, and you got to be very careful here, and uh, it does make a difference. You know, uh, for example, you know, uh, just for just to give you an example, the, uh, for the attitude towards the force majeure, if you are talking about force majeure. For English arbitrators, they basically say, well, this is a contractual issue. It's up to the parties to, to, to contractually agree as to what they define. But if you talk about the force measure, you know, uh, under the civil law jurisdictions, it's pretty much uh, you know, a statutory discussion independent of the contract. And I think that's the difference. So, so if you are facing uh, a tribunal, <coughs> mostly of the English law background arbitrators, I think there's no way to, to get out of those, uh, you know, uh, a long-term SPAs without you know arbitration review uh, without the price review clause. But if you're talking about a, a tribunal with civil background, probably they are more sympathizing you know the party uh, requesting the price review based on the hardship or uh, their th understanding of the force majeure. <coughs> and um, also the uh, the way uh, they uh, conduct the cross examination uh, uh, um, on the uh, witness. In the uh, in the uh, proceedings, is also different whether you are facing the uh, civil law background arbitrators or English law background arbitrators. The uh, discovery uh, procedure should not be expected in energy disputes because you know we don't expect the U.S. type of deposition procedures and also the, the the full discovery procedures in energy arbitration. But there could be some limited you know uh, right to discovery. And this is a su subject to the discretion of the tribunal. In a case which I handled twice, this issue of you know whether there is a, you know validity of product, uh, there is a uh, there is a commercial discovery, uh <coughs> because that absent of which that will terminate the PSC under Chinese law. It is both a, a, a legal interpretation issue. Uh, for me, there when I appear as a you know a China law expert to interpret on the Chinese law, it is also a factual inquiry as to whether there is a commercial discovery uh, based on the testimony given by the engineers and the, the scientists, and also if the other party is withholding information, and then it's problematic because it's going to be a critical information which touch upon the result of the uh, the result, but you know we can argue. Uh, you know, in other ways, where actually such, you know, uh, the uh, confidentiality has been waived uh, because you know uh, the other party is not consistent in withholding such information. <coughs> so I wouldn't go to other details because time is limited. And uh, so basically, I think uh, for uh, the 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 conclusion is that with the um, the outbound investment energy disputes going to arbitration in international inter arbitration forum, Chinese. Companies and uh, lawyers should cooperate with international legal community uh, and try to solve the problem. This is a challenge for them. This is going to be a learning curve for them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Slivin. It was a great overview of different arbitration clauses. And we will now move to an analysis of a very important question. And the question that's raised is, what would it take for China to become premier investment market for international renewable energy investors? And our speaker is a Dane, Jens Blomgren Hansen from the private law firm Krohmann and Reumert here in Copenhagen. Please. Hello there. Well, as, as it's already said, I have a somewhat different angle. I am a practi uh, practitioner. So uh, I'm a, a bit uh, far away from, from academia, um, but I have done projects in 67, 68 different jurisdictions, more than 100 projects, and I can say to date, uh, that's more than 20 years, close to 20 years now, none of the projects had restructured in various jurisdictions, many of them being the first to the market, many of them being emerging markets, have actually lost money. Uh, so I think, yes, do we have disputes? It's our prior speaker said, yes, we do. Do we solve them through traditional dispute resolution? Absolutely not. It takes too long. We lose money if we do that. So what do we then do? I think China has so far, when it comes to renewable energy, done all the investments basically themselves. 
So if, if I look to, to my clients, being institutional investors, be private equity funds, et cetera, I mean, they're not really investing or looking towards China for renewable energy investments yet. Not that they're not interested, but so far, I mean, there hasn't really been, been room for them. So if you then look at what is the approach by international investors, and, and we're going to make a little circle before we actually come to its conclusion relating to dispute resolution. Investors are looking at a risk-weighted return. So when we're involved, we say, okay, for this market, for this type of project, what kind of yield would you use, return would you expect as an investor, or what margin would require as a risk margin as a financier. And then we do a full analysis of the risk, and we come to a required risk-weighted return. Risk weighting is somewhat subjective. Uh, risk weighting is to a large extent a question of what prior experience do you have, what empiric evidence do you have out there, what is the real risk, what is perceived risk. Perceived risk is actually a quite important element because you can say in a number of markets, if we look at the real risk when we do the analysis, it could be that it actually looks fairly good because they've actually the country as such has structured a regime that if you look at it, it looks pretty good, it looks pretty watertight, but the investor or the bank would say, I have prior experience, or I heard from someone, or 15 years ago, Argentina went bankrupt. There's gotta be a risk there. They're probably corrupt, they're gonna do something bad. And that means that the yield required from the investors is gonna be much higher. The margins from the financiers gonna be much higher. So I mean, just by example, we're actually doing some projects in, in Argentina right now. And when I started up, I thought, hmm, okay, sure, Argentina had some problems. I look at the regime, the Argentina regime actually looks pretty good. Um, so, so I would expect, we're doing the financial transaction there, so I would expect for the margin from the financial markets to be lower than a compared to a product we just finished in Senegal. In fact, the margin is significantly higher because of the perceived risks. So. And the reason that I, I focus on, on perception is that I think part of the reason, as we're gonna come back to, for some investors not really bidding in or tendering for projects in, in China, is not just a question of the market maybe not really inviting international investment, it's much a question of the risk perception and thus the pricing. So if China, as we come back to it, is going to attract more international investors at a level where it's interesting, looking from a finance cost perspective, from a yield uh, perspective of the investors, equity investors, we need to do something about the risk perception. So, the little circle here, that is basically just flagging, so what are the main risk groups that we'll be looking at when we, we look at a project? Um, and we will then do the analysis, and I'm just gonna flip through, I mean, the risk groups, uh, because that's not what we'll be spending too much time on, but of course, do you have access to the land? Do you actually have the rights uh, in relation to the land? Can you mortgage it? Because otherwise, I mean, you cannot provide security to your investor or to the financiers. You cannot get financing. Um, so there is a, a basic finance package from the banks, international banks, saying, well, we need a full ring-fenced financing. So we need to have access, I mean, we need to have uh, rights to the land. We need to have step-in rights. We need access to the grids, uh, offtake agreements, etc. So everything needs to be structured to accommodate these requirements. Permits, and of course you need certain tin permits. I mean, if you have too much red tape, it takes too long, the developer is really not gonna do it, then intend to it, too much risk. We need to make sure that the permits and the terms of the permit actually reflects the term of the project. So you don't, you're not left with, say, wind turbines somewhere in, uh, in the western part of China, and then after five years you don't have a permit anymore, or you don't have access to, to the grid that we're coming back to. So. So you want to make sure that it's, it's, it's transparent, it's, it's objective, it's, it's equitable, et cetera. Uh, there are no national utility requirements, uh, domestic requirements. Uh, and for the financiers' perspective, again, we need to make sure that it can be transferred and there will be, be step in rights because that is the way the financiers will look at the fa uh, security packets, i.e., can they step in, take the projects, and run it to make sure they still have the cash flow to service the debt and, and pay it back. Turbines, a lot of investors, they have a, a very clear preference for certain turbines. If you tell them they cannot choose himself, they may very well not want to turn to the projects. Um, so, so if you were to set a requirement that it has to be 
produced in China, it would affect both finance cost and, and also the, the required return. Grid, very often issue. Um, IE, I, is, the, is the grid there? Does the grid have capacity today? Can you guarantee the grid in the future? What is the curtailment? So I mean, do you have any blackout periods where you cannot actually uh, see, see produce? Uh, and who actually takes the risk on it? Offtake agreements, uh, definitely the, the area where we have the most uh, see discussions. Um, if we go to emerging markets, uh, a lot of emerging markets, they look at their uh, the energy market and they say, hmm, we have old coal-fired power plants, we have maybe some diesel-fired power plants, they all are obsolete, we need new investments. Um, in fact, if we could if we could find international investors to build a wind park, maybe combined with some solar so you get close to a base load, uh, let's say in, in Senegal, I mean, those projects could even, with the yield required for Senegal and the finance cost there, could reduce the electricity costs in Senegal by 35, 40%. So at the same time, you would actually replace their obsolete coal, gas, and diesel uh, fire power plants. So they also save money on, on the infrastructure and investments that I should make. So everything makes very good sense. There's no doubt you have a lot, a lot of political support for that. However, we then look at the offtake agreement. Often someone, some lawyer in a Western country, have advised them that, well, balancing costs, as a who has the risk of being able to produce at a certain time, that should go to the investor or the project. No one can really control balancing in, in these markets. So that means that, in fact, you can then only sell maybe 70% of the production at the high price. So, of course, that reduces the cash flows and increases the risk. So, again, the yield will go up and the finance cost will go up. Then, typically, then you go and, and you look at the, the breach terms. So, who has the risk of the, the grit actually being available and then having the capacity? Typically, they say, well, hmm, we'll push that to the investor, and the investor is, of course, going to say no. So, you have all these elements where you can later have disputes. If you take for African projects, the African, most, a lot of the African countries then say, well, we'll provide you a guarantee. You're going to provide a guarantee from the state, so you should be happy. You have a guarantee from the state of Kenya or state of Senegal or uh, Ghana or whatever, whoever, all these countries that provide these guarantees. And, and, and I think for f that is all, that is all uh, very good, at least looks good on the face of it, but for most of them, uh, they have very little value not only because of the dispute resolution mechanism and these uh, guarantees, but also because I, I can they pay if they're actually willing to? Maybe <coughs> not, at least not in, in hard currency. Uh, and the next is that in order for you to make a claim under these guarantees, typically you need to prove that you actually have a claim under the PPA or the offtake agreement. If they have then posed a number of obligations to you, so you actually have obligations to feed in at a certain level or uh, comply to a specific code that doesn't really match a typical grid code or um, whatever obligations you come up with in these offtake agreements, you would actually not have a claim under the guarantee. So you would ev not even get to the dispute resolution mechanism. You basically don't have a claim. Taxes costs uh, is what you would expect to be. So if you just go to the legal framework, if you were to lower, if you were to attract more international investors and lower the required yield and the required cost of financing, we need clarity, we need transparency, and we need something that ensures fair and equitable treatment for the investors. For dispute resolution, I think if, if you look at uh, a number of, of, of the dispute resolutions already out there, uh, from an academic perspective, they're probably fine. In reality, it doesn't really work. It is a last resort. So I'm not saying that we do not care about the dispute resolutions mechanisms in these agreements. Uh, I'm just saying that to us, it is a last resort. Uh, and the only way we actually use them is to ensure that we have some bargaining power. Because of course, if we didn't have the right, we would have a fairly weak position. But there is a often a significant gap between being right, so having the legal rights, and being able to exercise those rights. 
So, so we actually just try to ensure that we have a better bargaining position. position. And the reason often that these dispute resolution mechanisms do not work is that time is just too long. If you look at the various disputes you have under the ECT, it takes years. So, so yes, I may potentially, in a number of years, prove that I'm right. And yes, I may get an award, but if I'm a project company that's been project financed, I would have died financially before then. So at that time, I wouldn't give a damn. So if, if this is to make any sense, we need to find a solution that is still clear, transparent, ensures fair and actual treatment to all investors. It must be objective, enforceable, and we need to make sure that we get our resolution to those disputes very quick. I already addressed uh, some of the other jurisdictions, and, and, and funny thing is that, again, going back to, to, to perceived risk, if you look at at the, the current dispute under the ECT, and I recognize that a, a large number of the uh, signatories to the ECT, they are, they are uh, European countries, but nevertheless, if you look through it, most of the disputes are related to European countries. And if you look at the issues we had in the European jurisdictions, they are many. Um, nevertheless, the risk perception for investing in to renewable energy projects in Europe is very low. So right now, if I look at a number of projects where I would say that's actually a significant risk, the yield required from investors is so low that I think they're not getting paid for any risk, not even the operational risks in there. Um, but that's the market today. Um, as I started out saying, we have done a number of projects, uh, Southeast Asia, Africa, uh, Central, Middle, uh, Central America, South America, we've no lost money on these projects. So when we start looking at these projects, we look at, okay, is there actually political support? Can we provide value to this country by doing the projects to ensure that they have an interest in actually backing this project and attracting more investments? That is our starting point, always. Energy Charter Treaty, I think scope of it, it's broad, it's good. There's a little issue if you look towards China about uh, uh, Article 26, uh, carve outs, um, but we'll come back to that. But in general, from an academic perspective, the ECT is a good idea. In practice, it doesn't really bring me much value. So my recommendation to China, if we were to make a China a more attractive country from an international, international investment perspective and for international banks, Make sure that if you take the six main groups that you have covered all those, make sure that yes, you will have clear rights to the land. You, you can actually uh, provide a mortgage to in the good security packets. Uh, you do have access to the grid. It's very clear. Uh, your, your permissions, uh, permits, uh, et cetera, are also clear and, and, and people get comfortable about all that. So it basically leaves you at the very end with the whole risk, perceived risk in relation to what happens if there is a dispute. Coming to that, I mean, we need to make sure that there is a, an objective, fair and quick process. I'm not saying that national courts in China are not fair and objective. I'm just saying international markets don't necessarily believe it. So, um, and since costs are based on perceptions, I think China needs to, to ensure, to find a way where they can start changing those perceptions. So one way to do this could basically be to establish a parallel to the ECT over the quicker process. So basically we take the, the ECT scope, we, uh, we make sure that we also catch the Article 26, so, it's the, uh, so you also catch the, the uh, state-owned enterprises and the uh, public entities, which are gonna be your counterparties very often. So, so they don't have a, a carve out for that. Um, then we must be sure that if you then get the award within, I would say three months, then the award should be easily enforceable. That could be through a state guarantee or guarantee pool that would be quickly enforceable uh, as you have in, in Argentina right now, where they've established a pool that you can go to. Um, 
and 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 then I think in order to 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 get a hand on those perceived risks, uh, it should probably be established uh, outside China and also have representatives that are non-Chinese. So, quick and dirty. I think all from my side. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jens, for highlighting these main groups of concerns that need to be uh, observed, including that all risks have costs, uh, the importance of having a stable and transparent legal framework, and a fair treatment of investors that include an effective and enforceable dispute uh, resolution mechanism. So we will now be moving to our third presentation. Uh, I welcome Munir Mani Rutterman, who is professor uh, at the Portmouth Law School in the United Kingdom. And uh, Munir will talk about energy investment protection and dispute resolution along the New Silk Road with a special focus on South Asia. Please. Thank you for your nice introduction. Um, today, uh, my focus will be mainly on South Asia, because already quite a lot has been said in respect of um, Ober. Um, so I'm just trying to focus on a specific area uh, where investment in the Ober projects uh, by China and Chinese state-owned enterprises, and of course many uh, other investors could be involved. So, I mean, familiar scenario, but I'll be concerned with two economic corridors of the Ober project, and I mean, out of six, you know, economic corridors here, um, looking at these, these two, uh, one through Pakistan and on through Bangladesh, <coughs> India and uh, China, My Myanmar. So uh, these are the South Asian countries uh, where uh, my focus uh, would be, just uh, mainly Pakistan. India and Bangladesh, major ones. Um, so, I mean, these are the sort of uh, BRI economic corridors. Um, that's Bangladesh, China, India, Myanmar. Um, so there are various projects, um, you know, China, Myanmar, crude oil, and liqui liquefied. Uh, natural gas, LNG pipeline, and also some other uh, you know, infrastructure projects. And uh, here you see going through Myanmar, quite a few Chinese uh, investments. And of course, uh, China-Pakistan economic corridor, where you will find, uh, of course, um, quite a lot of energy investment. Now, you know, several examples, for example, China Pakistan Economic Corridor, LNG terminal pipeline projects, you know, which was about 46, <laughs> and now it's increased to 66 billion um, projects. And of course, China's, um, you know, purchasing um, uh, kind of gas fired power projects in various countries uh, in that region, mainly Bangladesh and Pakistan. Now, the legal uh, framework that's there, um, I'll be very much concerned with uh, uh, investor estate disputes and very much related to uh, BITS in that region. So, India, China, BIT, 2006, and uh, what sort of investment and uh, what investors uh, could be uh, protected? Of course, you know, natural and juridical persons uh, are protected as investors. And of course, the definition is a bit uh, wide because these uh, Chinese BITs, I suppose, 
third generation BID. It has wider uh, kind of uh, encompass in terms of how it can be defined as protected investments, every kind of asset in accordance with the national laws of the host state. And of course, investments which are accepted in the host state according to its own laws and regulations. Of course, again, looking at uh, the protective sort of measures which are adopted in India-China, BIT 2006, of course, these are the standard ones, fair and equitable treatment, national treatment, most favored national treatment, of course, uh, with uh, the usual exceptions, customs unions, and it's special you know, tax treatment and all that. Then, of course, looking at uh, the other aspect, I mean, expropriation, which is just according to the standard uh, kind of uh, conditions, the expropriation should be subject to public policy, it should be non-discriminatory, and fair and equitable compensation must be paid. But again, you see the valuation for expropriation um, expropriated property uh, could be reviewed by judicial and independent authority of the expropriating uh, state under its own law. And I, again, you see in that treaty, uh, protection has been given uh, to uh, losses occurred uh, by war, armed conflict, state of emergency, civil disturbance, uh, uh, compensation to be paid uh, on a on an MFN basis. And again, you see, looking at the scenario, investor estate dispute settlement, I mean, there is a provision for uh, amicable settlement, as usual, and then six months would be allowed to that. And if that fails, then of course, it should be hostess competent uh, judicial, arbitral, ad or administrative bodies or if the parties agree, it could be uh, referred to international conciliation under the conciliation rules of the ANSITRAL, United Nations Commission on International Trade Law. So there are two options there um, to refer the dispute uh, to hostess court or international conciliation rules of the ANSITRAL. Again, you see, if those sort of steps fail, then of course, the parties could refer to exit. Of course, India is not uh, a participant or a signatory to the exit uh, convention. So still, it is uh, you know kind of a bracketed case. You know when it would be a party to exit. Of course, China is a party to exit. Then, of course, uh, exit additional facility rules could be followed, or if the parties agree, then. Ancestral arbitration rules, 1976, as it's mentioned there, could be followed. Now, you could see a giant leap from there. There is uh, China India BIT 2006 to the Indian model BIT. Now, China has already um, sort of notified 40 plus. You know, BAT partners uh, to terminate uh, their uh, BITs with them. Now, of course, the new BITs are to be on the basis of Indian model BIT 2015. And what would be the scenario there in the host state as far as the investors' protections concerned? And of course, the dispute resolutions um, matters. Um, that, that could be uh, in question. Now, of course, the characteristic features of that Indian model BIT 2015, I mean, looking at the defici definitional scope of the protected investment, you'll see it's very much constrained. I mean, many matters which used to be considered in the 2006 BIT with China are now just outside. Uh, investment protection. Uh, of course, protection and guarantee provisions are there, which are substantive provisions. I'll come to those sort of things soon. And of course, there are obligations 
mutual obligations, hostess obligations, and investors obligations. And then of course, there is a safety valve. And we know as far as the uh, dispute resolution matters concerned, it's the kind of, for the benefit of India, I mean, it has specifically provided for local remedies rule and the mechanism and the processes uh, how to go through that, I mean, all are specifically defined. Now, you see, looking at the sort of types of investments, which could be subject matter of Indian model BIT, <laughs> China, you know, becomes a party uh, to a sort of BIT with India, of course, depending on the bargaining power of, I don't know, respective bargain, bargaining power of the parties. Of course, if China gives in to Indian model BIT, then of course, what could be the scenario? Of course, looking at the investment, I mean, enterprises that has the characteristics of an investment, such as commitment of capital or other resources, certain duration, and expectation of gain and profit, and the assumption of risk and significance uh, of the development of the host state. That means, you know, either Chinese um, you know, sin or the Indian sin, wherever it is, it should be for the development of the country concerned. Now, this provision, you know, developmental perspective of investment perhaps has been borrowed from uh, Salini versus Morocco case, and that case established quite squarely, you know, um, uh, for the purpose of uh, defining investment, you know, that element should be present. Perhaps, you know, Indian drafters, you know, took lessons from there. And of course, there are itemized list of investments, um, and with that, I mean, there is also a proviso that any other interests of the enterprise which involves substantial economic activity out of which the enterprise derives significant financial value. So it means, you know, no post box kind of, you know, company that could be treated as investor. It must be something of substantial economic uh, sort of activity there. Um, and looking at the sort of things which are specifically uh, kept outside uh, the BIT's uh, protection, I mean, there are the sort of things, uh, portfolio investments, loans, debt securities issued by the government or any pre-investment activities, including any pre-investment um, or pre-operational expenditure before the commencement of the of substantial business, money claims arising from trade in goods and services, from commercial transactions, goodwill, brand value, market share, or similar intangible rights, as well as judgment or an award. All these things are outside the definition of investment. I mean these are I mean this scenario is the reflection of uh, arbitral jurisprudence, so to speak. I mean, awards, judgments, arbitral awards, judgments, I mean, these are used by third party funders as investment. So these matters are outside the uh, VAT protection. And of course, uh, yesterday, somebody was just uh, talking about services. I mean, uh, you know, they, they could be sort of foreign investment services provided by foreign companies. And now these are outside the protection of the Indian BIT. Now you can see protected investors, both natural and juridical persons as usual, um, but protected investors must have substantial business activities in the host state. I mean, that is to curb the forum shopping of most favorable BITs for redress. Now, natural person of dual nationality considered having the nationality of the country of permanent residence for the protection of BIT. It, it cannot be just dual national who has no link with India or with China uh, can have any protection under that BIT if they make any sort of investment 
uh, in one of the contracting parties. Now, the regime substantive protection, I mean, there are the usual things like full protection and security. I mean, that relates only to physical sort of protection, not legal uh, security. And of course, uh, national treatment, um, whereby a foreign investor must not receive less favorable treatment than a domestic investor of host state. So full protection and security and national treatment, these two treatments have been very carefully chosen by the Indian drafters um, for substantive protection. But you know, curiously enough, uh, fair and equitable treatment and most favored national treatment, these two uh, protective items have been kept out of the VAT model. I mean, there that, that could be reasons because fair and equitable treatment is so um, uh, sort of uh, fluid kind of concept and it varies from arbitrations to arbitrations in terms of interpretation. The scope is unlimited. Anything can be put in the omelette and like, you know, fair and equitable treatment uh, would be another omelette. So that's why Indian doctors were very cautious uh, to left, leave out this uh, fair and equitable standard. I mean, fair and most favored national treatment again. I mean, India has a lot of experiences in this respect with foreign investors because there was sort of forum shopping with the favorable uh, provisions in other um, uh, BATS uh, to take advantage of. And then, uh, you know, that was creating some problem uh, on the national level. So uh, MFN treatment has been left out of that. Now, of course, I mean, this is a new element, uh, not exactly in Indian model BAT, but it's happening in other places like uh, uh, Morocco and Nigerian uh, recent BIT, uh, that is uh, 2016, and of course various other BITs. Uh, of course, China is uh, getting involved in those kind of BITs where uh, foreign investors are having equal uh, responsibilities or some kind of responsibilities on their shoulders. Um, now, of course, um, apart from the host state's obligations, which are usual, then the um, foreign investors, of course, normally they have to you know, comply with the laws and regulations of uh, the host state. And of course, it includes prohibition to obtain undue advantage over other investors through illicit practices, such as bribery and conspiracy with officials of the host state. And of course, foreign investors have to, um, you know, respect um, international sort of soft law um, sort of obligations of corporate social responsibility. I mean, these matters could be sometimes problematic when a dispute arises. You know, what is meant by corporate social responsibility? It's a fluid kind of uh, notion, and it can encompass uh, many things. And these days. Uh, climate change obligations, uh, climate compliance obligations, all sorts of things, uh, environmental um, sort of finest, um, you know, sort of uh, concepts. Uh, so it's it's kind of open-ended uh, sort of matters. But the foreign investors could be accused of not uh, complying with those, you know, corporate social responsibility obligations. And of course, looking at the UN guiding principles on business and human rights and the um, uh, UN um, Global Compact uh, principles, and of course, uh, various you know, uh, the guidelines, OECD guidelines and everything. So it's a very fluid concept. The foreign investors could end up with a lot of disputes in the, f in the future. Now, looking at the specific uh, kind of scenario, exertion of local remedies and arbitration, local remedies is the first, you know, protocol. They have to go through the national sort of courts, and then 
it could be judicial or administrative uh, uh, bodies, and then there are sort of uh, you know sort of periods. You know they have to have five years first, uh, minimum five years, and a further cooling period of six months, and then the disputing parties may uh, initiate arbitration by serving a notice uh, dispute. Now, conditions of arbitration. There are certain conditions. Two minutes, right. Certain conditions are to be fulfilled before arbitration can be um, initiated. Then, of course, uh, India has the sort of um, you know, exit convention um, and additional facilities um, rules or unsettled um, sort of rules. Of course, there is appellate review body under Indian model BIT uh, for the consistence, uh, consistence of uh, interpretation of uh, treaties and all that, if the parties so agree. Of course, Pakistan and China BAT, I mean, one is the first generation um, here, that BAT, and the other one, FTA, uh, which deals with um, investment and trade, um, 2007, reflecting the uh, most recent developments in, the, in Chinese uh, foreign policy in respect of investment. Now you see, standards of treatment, I mean, there is no national treatment there um, in Pakistan, China, BAT, and then most favored national treatment. Um, but FTA has uh, both national treatment and FTN. Again, you see, uh, with uh, exceptions uh, well, you know, to MFN, Of course, uh, sustainable development provisions, I mean, that's the characteristic there in the preamble of a free trade agreement, but nothing is there as such in the sort of BIT. And of course, I you know Chinese action plan uh, regarding over corporate social responsibility uh, could be a lesson for the parties. Now again, you see under BIT, it's about compensation uh, matter uh, that, that can be the subject matter of uh, arbitration, uh, oh sorry, um, ISDS, and then FTA, it is just any legal disputes far beyond uh, the compensation issue. Um, now the interesting thing in the uh, sort of uh, BAT and FTA, uh, is the sort of applicable law, applicable substantive law. Um, it's quite encompassing the domestic law of the host state, including uh, rules of conflict law, the Robo situation, and the provisions of FTA and universally accepted principles of international law. But BID is completely a uh, different scenario. I mean, it uh, provides for the principles of international law recognized by state parties. Now, of course, you see the other country, the last one uh, in that you know, corridor, Bangladesh-China VAT, uh, that was 1996 one. So again, you see every kind of asset that is, uh, and also in accordance with the subject matter of the host state. Um, and it includes both direct and portfolio investment and uh, protected investors, juridical and uh, uh, natural. Now you see fair and equitable treatment is there, most MFN treatment with usual exceptions there. No national treatment provisions there in the uh, Bangladesh BAT with China. But the transfers for investment returns there. Now again you see the uh, investment matter, um, disputes arising out of uh, amount of compensation for expropriation uh, could be submitted to ad hoc arbitration. And that ad hoc arbitration could be, you know, subject to some rules, you know, um, on the basis of uh, exit arbitration rules. And 
I mean, dispute resolution provisions of other favorable uh, MFN uh, uh, clauses, um, other BATs uh, could be uh, resorted to. And then the applicable law allowed the host estate, including its conflict of laws rules, BAT provisions, is the you know, standard Chinese BAT provision there. So um, thanks. I'll be ready to answer any questions that you would like to ask. Uh, and this was a focus on uh, South Asia countries. We'll now move to a completely different region, the one of Nigeria. And we have a pair. We have two speakers. Ulubayu um, Uluduro uh, from uh, Nigeria and uh, Wen Xiang from the same uh, center as I come from, the Center of Public Regulation and Administration at this faculty and university. Please. Thank you very much. Um, I bring greetings from Nigeria, and I must appreciate uh, the organizers of this uh, conference for extending uh, the invitation to me to come and participate this great uh, conference. Um, like I said, we, this is a joint paper to be presented, uh, presented uh, jointly. Background. Um, Nigeria is a country with about uh, 100, over 180 million uh, people, and uh, it has the largest economy in Africa. So it is a very important uh, country to the world. And uh, Nigeria is a country that is blessed with abundant natural resources, particularly in terms of uh, oil and uh, gas. And little wonder why several countries all over the world uh, almost long after to invest in Nigeria as a country. So Nigeria is the Africa's biggest, largest uh, oil producer, and arguably the seventh largest producer of oil in, uh, in the world. And so it, uh, because of that, it is one of the five most important countries uh, in Africa that uh, China, uh, China inv Chinese investment uh, is being, uh, uh, is being sought after in the energy sector. And uh, why China in Nigeria? Um, China has become interested in Nigeria because it has to meet up with the declining uh, oil production in China. And so to fill up the gap between the domestic uh, production and consumption, there is need for China to look, uh, to go out of China to look for where to import oil. So China shifted from net oil exporter in the early 1990s to become oil uh, importer in 1993. And so the dependency of China on foreign uh, oil uh, becomes uh, as risen up to the 64.4% in 2016 and it is expected to also grow uh, continuously. So we now move on to why China's investment in the uh, Nigeria energy sector. Um, as noted by Erica Downs, we have uh, he mentioned just three of uh, the several reasons which also applies uh, to Nigeria. And uh, one, like I said, is just to fill up the gap uh, between the uh, domestic production of oil in China and the consumption. So it also, China wants to reduce uh, its rate of dependency on the middle in the Middle East because Middle East is, uh, uh, for now is not stable and it's a volatile region. And so in case of embargo from the Western the world, then it must have somewhere to fall back on. It's one of the reasons why it has to depend on uh, Nigeria's uh, oil. And also, China wants to insulate its economy from price hike in case of uh, international uh, uh, price hike in, uh, in the international market. Also, it is also being driven by the lucrative profit from the uh, oil investment all over the world. And uh, for that, the African oil, particularly Nigerian oil, is, has a unique attribute. And part of the unique attribute of oil in Nigeria is that what the crude oil is with low density and uh, with sulfur content. So it is oil of high quality. Hence, China is interested in that kind of uh, quality oil. And uh, because of that, uh, the NOC, China's, Chinese NOC, the National Oil Corporations in China, now has to what, uh, tap into the go out, uh, go abroad policy in uh, China. And this led the Chinese government to come into Nigeria to invest in the oil uh, sector in uh, 
Nigeria. And so we have uh, oil companies like Sinopec, we have the China Petroleum, um, um, I mean, China National Offshore Oil, that is CNOOC, we have the CNPC and several oil companies uh, in Nigeria. Uh, uh, I want to say that China has a lot of interest in Nigeria, in uh, the construction company, in the infrastructure com uh, area, in terms of electricity, why, but the major focus uh, of China in Nigeria is in terms of oil and gas. And so about 87% of uh, Nigeria's export to China uh, falls on, uh, is being on the oil and gas uh, product. And some of the oil related investments include those that have been listed, but I didn't want to bore the participant with this, but most importantly, you can see all the figures here that in 2009, Sinopec took over others at a value of 7.2 billion. We have, uh, in April 2006, we have uh, uh, CNOC acquiring a 45% stake in Nigeria oil for gas feed at about 2.27 billion dollars, and so on and so forth. So the list is inexhaustive, anyway, including the recent one in December two, uh, 2017. So the investments in Nigeria is quite uh, huge and high. And the types and sources of dispute, investment dispute in the energy sector have been uh, highlighted by several uh, scholars, I mean, uh, presenters here. Uh, I didn't want to bore the participant with still the same, uh, the same problem in the energy sector. And the various approach to dispute resolution mechanism also have been variously discussed here by the participant, including resulting to domestic courts, diplomatic relationships, and then the direct negotiation with the host, international arbitration, and so on and so forth. And that takes us to the BITs between Nigeria and China that uh, came into being in 2001. I hand over to my colleague. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, uh Alabayo, so it's a, a great pleasure uh, for working, uh, you know, a paper collaboratively with uh, Professor Alabayo Aladurum, since we have been also uh, colleagues for quite a um, quite a few years um, during our PhD. Uh, so, um, uh, as he has already said, I mean, this uh, presentation is based on a, a, a you know preliminary um, um, you know findings from our uh, paper to be present uh, in this conference. So we will be uh, addressing this issue uh, from some you know, specific uh, perspective of, um, for example, sustainable, sustainable development on the uh, role of uh, bilateral investment treaties uh, with a specific focus on the relations between Nigeria and China in the energy sector. So um, as we may know that uh, there is actually a growing revolt uh, actually against the bilateral investment treaties. Um, we have seen that there are several countries in Latin America uh, actually uh, refused uh, you know, to renew or ref uh, de-launched some of those existing uh, uh, BITs. Uh, also, it happens to South Africa, you know, uh, recently refused, uh, you know, to renew this uh, BIT with uh, uh, contracting states. So we, we, we are seeing this um, uh, issue from the perspective of sustainable de development. We see that, you know, the traditional way of um, BITs, uh, you know, in favor of the, um, the investors' interest without, the, you, know, uh, you know, taking that much uh, consideration of the host uh, states. So we think this uh, is uh, probably not the way that can be uh, uh, addressed in uh, from the perspective of sustainable development. So we would like to uh, find out what can be better addressed in uh, this specific, you know, BIT between Nigeria and China. Uh, well, in terms of this uh, BIT between Nigeria and China, I mean, it en uh, it's um, well enter. I think it was adopted in 2001 and inter entered into force uh, in 2010, a couple of years ago. Uh, well, the well general char characteristics of this uh, BIT is similar to many of those uh, you know existing ones uh, between China and some other uh, you know states. Uh, well, it promotes you know the economic cooperation and the encourage the investors to you know make investments in their territory and uh, you know admit such investments in accordance with its uh, law and regulations uh, well also you know um, there are some you know uh, 
uh, regulations on this fire and equitable treatment in the territory of other contracting party as well as no uh, expropriation against the investment of investors unless uh, you know some following conditions are met. These are actually very similar to uh, work, uh, most of those BITs. Uh, so I'm not going to spend that much time on that. And uh, what's going to be what's going to be the problems I mean existing in the China Nigeria BIT as I just mentioned very briefly uh, at the beginning. Uh, well, we all know that the BIT is not uh, energy specific, um, and so uh, do not address the most specific barriers uh, necessary uh, for the enhancement of investment relationship, particularly. Uh, environmental and social and sustainable development issues. Well, <coughs> uh, it doesn't contain any environmental clauses. Uh, the environmental governance in Nigeria is uh, well, well, relatively weak uh, to protect against the rules potential environmental damage. Uh, and, uh, the environmental clause actually uh, clauses are necessary in BITs to ensure that the investment instruments do not embed the state's rights to regulate the environment as well as to prevent the state from failing to enforce its environmental regulations in order to attract new investment. Uh, well, <coughs> this uh, BIT does also not uh, cover the issues relating to the observance of human rights uh, in the exploration or exploitation of natural, resource natural resources. It has no provision on corporate social responsibility. Well imposing duties on investors uh, you know, to observe and perform CSR well, uh, they per operate. Uh, we can see that there are some ongoing issues you know, addressing this CSR and sustainable development in some of those uh, uh, latest uh, BITs, uh, such as this uh, BIT uh, uh, between Australia and Nigeria signed in 2013. Uh, it's not yet it's not yet in force, and also there are some others like you know the the BIT between Canada and Benin. Uh, uh, some of those recent BITs in the field of investment, you know, uh, directly or indirectly through um, explicit reference made to the existing CR, uh, CSR instruments such as these OECD guidelines or the UN Global uh, Compact. I think it's been mentioned very briefly by the uh, Professor Muller from Portmos, <coughs> and. Well, uh, also there are some, you know, pieces missing from the Nigeria China China Nigeria BIT, such as you know this uh, provision on corruption and transparency in their investment relationship. Um, as we know, this oil uh, industry uh, in Nigeria is characterized as um, you know lacking of transparency. Well, this. Uh <coughs> Uh, there are some actually ongoing investigations, uh, you know, on relevant to uh, you know some of the Chinese companies' corruption issues in in, in uh, Nigeria. So uh, it's been an ongoing issue has been uh, witnessed by some of those uh, you know authorities. Also, uh, uh, you know, this inclusion of transparency requirements in investment treaties will help in reminding and uh, reinforcing the ob obligations on all you know, size and in facilitating the enforcement of the obligations as a part of investor state dispute settlement, such uh, that where a host state fails to prosecute a public officer who s s uh, solicits a bribe from an investor, the investor could make use of the anti-corruption provinces in the BIT to seek redress from for such violation. Well, I think it also can help eliminate tensions and conflicts in uh, leisure data regions um, which reaches in oil resources and <coughs> contribute to uh, social and economic development and promote you know transparent investment climate in the energy uh, sector um, well still there is a part missing on the sustainable development um, well, this inclusion of such a, a provision on uh, sustainable development will help China improve its laws and also, and also assist Nigeria to improve its environmental law and to protect the environmental, particularly as most of the energy projects affect a large number of those indigenous people uh, in such areas. Uh, well, this can be you know, uh, reviewed 
in comparison of, uh, with some of those uh, newly signed, uh, you know, BITs between uh, Canada, for example, between Canada and Cameroon and Canada and uh, Nigeria. Some of those, you know, missing part actually uh, were reflected in those natives, the BITs between Nigeria or between some of those African countries and uh, and, and some Western countries. So. <coughs> Uh, the above challenges, which I have just mentioned very briefly, in the China-Nigeria BIT need to be addressed. You know, considering some of the negative views concerning China's uh, you know image in Africa, which I believe is very important to be uh, you know tangled. In a way, uh, well, you know, there are many actually. You know, uh, these criticisms actually are not specifically addressing China's. Uh, Chinese companies issue actually it goes to all those you know oil industries and multinational uh, national uh, 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 you know oil companies actually in Nigeria, also from Western countries. So that's not actually a specific issue uh, uh, goes to China. Uh, but I think there is a, a good sign. I mean, uh, you know, the latest development for this issue, I would say, uh, uh, back in you know September 2017, which I found, uh, you know, there is an environmental. It's a sort of a guideline or initiative on environmental risk management for China's you know overseas investment. Well, I quoted here, you know, those financial institutions and enterprises engaged in overseas investment should fully understand the environmental laws, regulations, you know, standards in the host countries, you know, those are, uh, uh, as well as the key environmental risks for such, you know, projects. And those entities en engaged in overseas investment should understand the environmental standards, environmental law regulations for those specific sectors. I believe it includes uh, oil uh, and energy sector, as well as those sector-specific environmental risks and the mitigation approaches. Well, I do believe that's going to be very important, you know, for China to review those sort of like you know bilateral invest uh, investment treaties with uh, Nigeria and some other countries in Africa. Uh, and I will leave this part to my colleague Alubayo. Thank you very much. Um, well, we will begin to wonder why we continue to stress on the BIT provisions. It is very important because when we look at Nigeria, most of the conflict, because we are talking of dispute resolution, most of the conflicts in the region, we have about 36 states in Nigeria, and only nine out of the 36 states are the oil producing states, and we call the region Niger Delta region, Nigeria. So the area, the Niger Delta region is a volatile area conflicts every day, disputes every day among the local community because of the environmental hazards that they witness every day. And that is why we continue to stress on the fact that where all the CLS provisions, human rights provisions should be contained in the BIT that is being, uh, between Nigeria and uh, China. Having said that, we are zeroing on the fact that well, uh, we have looked at different approaches to dispute resolution, but rather we are saying that well, we should stick to the arbitration that is contained inside the BIT between China and uh, Nigeria. And this, we want to buttress this fact by saying that Nigeria has a legal framework on arbitration, a very at least fairly good legal framework on arbitration in place in Nigeria. When we look at first, we look at the NIPC, that is Nigerian Investment Promotion Commission Act. Section 26 thereof provides for what arbitration, uh, arbitration in case of dispute between Nigerian government and foreign uh, investor. So it goes to point to the fact that we are not new in terms of the practice of uh, arbitration. So it's a point, it's a plus. Then we also look at the Petroleum Act of 1969, which is also the relevant law as of today too. And the Regulation 41 also based provision for what? For arbitration, the place of arbitration, uh, where there are disputes in terms of a uh, petroleum uh, oil producing license. Then we also look at the Nigerian Liquefied Natural Gas uh, Act of 2004. Section 22, there are also some inspiration for uh, arbitration there before the ICSID. Then that takes us to the BIT, Articles 8 and 9 of the BIT between China and Nigeria, make copious provision for dispute uh, resolution. And it talks of what the, uh, the need for first engaging in amicable negotiation between the parties and where within six months it faced 
then the parties have option of either having recourse to the court, domestic court, or going further by what? Uh, taking to arbitration procedure. But we are a party, one of the parties, of particularly the foreign investor, has chosen domestic court. Then he can no longer have recourse back to what? To the arbitration. He has to stick to that domestic uh, court. So, and so the procedures are contained under articles 8 and uh, 9 on arbitration. So, having said that, uh, we are now saying that once the investor has submitted the dispute to the competent court of the whole state, it can no longer bring a claim to an ad hoc international arbitration uh, tribunal. You must stick to it. As of today, we are saying that there is no known, uh, no known uh, energy dispute between Nigeria and China. No, we don't have as of today. And that is what informed the title prognosis of a dispute settlement uh, paradigm. In case there is this dispute as of today, there has never been any dispute regarding oil and gas projects between China and Nigeria. And there is no public, uh, uh, there is no award of any sort against uh, Nigeria under any of its B BITs at all. And so the Nigerian courts are yet to be called upon to enforce an investment treaty award against uh, Nigeria. So we have never seen such. Uh, so as of today, we have three cases filed at the ICSID by foreign investors in, re in respect of uh, investment uh, treaties in uh, Nigeria. Two of the cases were discontinued before it gets to the final stage of final award. The only, uh, the only case that is standing bef uh, before the ICSID is the Inter-Ocean Oil Development Company uh, against the Federal Republic of uh, Nigeria, and the case is still pending in the court. So there is no dispute as of today between Nigeria and China or any of its BITs or, or any other countries regarding the BITs signed. And to further buttress the fact that the, we have at least fairly good arbitration the procedure in Nigeria, we, Nigeria has adopted uh, uh, the Arbitration and Conciliation Act, which is modeled after the Uncitra model law. It's in place in uh, Nigeria. We are also parties to the ICSI D and we ratify same in 1965, uh, 1965 and we have domesticated, uh, domesticated it as part of uh, our own domestic uh, law in Nigeria to show the importance that Nigeria attached to arbitration procedure in Nigeria. And so, and uh, once you have an award, you can enforce it. The award, the award is taken to the Supreme Court of Nigeria, which is the highest court of Nigeria, not before the High Court or Court of Appeal, to show the importance of the award. You take it to the Supreme Court as the first of first uh, court of first instance by the party and is thereby enforced. So you are sure that in case you have dispute with foreign investor, the vessel is sure that the judgment gotten from the SID is going to be enforced in the Nigerian uh, uh, in, in Nigeria. We are also parties or signatories to the New York Convention on Recognition and Enforcement of a uh, Award. Nigeria is a party and uh, uh, and so be based on the fact that both China and Nigeria are parties to ICSID and New York Convention, then we have strong assurances that uh, in case there's arbitral awards, it's going to be ultimately uh, enforced. And uh, so we also have arbitration institutions in Nigeria, uh, in Lagos and several other places. And uh, we are also saying that where rather than going through the court system, Nigeria is not, uh, I mean, rather than following the step of South Africa, we are South Africa is currently cancelling uh, BITs with its uh, state members. We are saying we are not yet right for that in Nigeria because our judicial system is rather very weak for that kind of, uh, for us to adopt the same uh, system adopted by South Africa. And uh, so uh, the other challenges that we say we, we can, should be attended to include the lack of transparency mentioned by uh, my, my friend there, the militancy and the security in the Niger Delta region. And uh, we are urging Nigeria that to ensure that we have uh, a good investment climate between China and Nigeria, then the security must be ensured so that investors will be able to come to Nigeria. And finally, BIT protections and recourse to international relations towards protecting contracting parties' rights remain important and germane between the relationship between China and Nigeria. We strongly converse for same to continue. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, wonderful overview of what must be addressed in order to prevent energy disputes. Uh, several examples, that's for sure. I know that you're probably desperate for lunch, but, but I'm just going to investigate whether there are a few very brief burning questions. Jens. Thank you. My question would go to Professor Mani Zaman. 
And the question is about the fact that even if no um, fair and equitable treatment has been in included in the new model, but there is a list which uh, prohibits uh, um, commit violations and that would be uh, basically boiling things down to due process, which authorities anyway would consider the key element of fair and equitable treatment. And the other question or comment was, uh, would you explain your insistence on corporate social responsibility the reasons for insistence in addressing environmental challenges, knowing that this very restrictive with regard to foreign investors new model bit uh, of India of 2015 anyway insists on the right to regulate specifically in environmental matters. Sure. Uh, yes, uh, fair and equitable treatment. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. Um, Fair and equitable treatment um, is quite widespread uh, across the BATS and the arbitral jurisprudence is not consistent on that and that was perhaps the fear for uh, Indian drafters, you know, just to you know, avoid it, you know, don't include something uh, of which we don't know any shape of, uh, shape and we cannot handle this kind of hot potato. Right, so leave it aside. Now, fair and equitable treatment, um, well, I mean, this is a sleeping beauty because for many years, you know, since 1959, when first BAT was, you know, sort of entered into, um, this fair and equitable treatment was not really um, sort of looked at. Now, you know, sort of in sort of, uh, uh, modern days, you know, anything which is quite uh, sort of cannot be de defined in terms of national treatment or other treatments. So that can be sort of, you know, interpreted in light of fair and equitable treatment. And now there are cultural issues, cultural issues in the sense fair and equitable treatment in Saudi Arabia in religious sense. Uh, could be different from, you know, that in Russia, uh, fair and equitable treatment varies from culture to culture. I mean, that dimension is not far away to look at. I mean, uh, the more you expand it, the more you go extra miles. Uh, so that was quite uh, difficult. Now, uh, this is so problematic, you know. We could live with that fair and equitable treatment for many years, you know, um, through the history of BATs. Now, fair and equitable is a sleeping beauty. Now, suddenly it has woken up and, you know, creating all sorts of problems. So, um, anything, you know, what can be sort of interpreted in other sort of contexts, um, th that should be the kind of, uh, you know, expectation, not anything that is not expected in terms of fair and uh, you know, equitable treatment. Uh, that you bring forth. So that, that was quite restrictive um, in a way, but that's uh, what it has eventually, you know, sort of settled. Now, about corporate social responsibility, this is a fluid area, as I have mentioned. I mean, I mean, looking at different sort of guidelines, you know, different corporate guidelines, or OECD guidelines, uh, I mean, more and more things are being included in, in that package. Um, human rights, uh, environmental sort of uh, considerations, and also, you know, anti-corruption, all sorts of various things are coming up. Now, you know, it is open-ended. Now, if the foreign investor could be accused of not complying with, you know, internationally accepted corporate social responsibility principles or obligations, uh, then of course, um, you know, there is a breach of these uh, investors' obligation, right? Uh, disputes would arise, and again, that would be subject to um, arbitral sort of uh, whim of interpretation. So these things are open-ended, really, unless you define exactly what is corporate social responsibility that the foreign investors will have to look after to, to comply with. Uh, but nothing uh, in the gray area, nothing in uh, other sort of, you know, assumed areas. So 
uh, that, that is, you know, remains to be, that, 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 that's remains to be seen uh, how it's going to go, you know, in the, in the sort of coming days. Thank you very much, Munir. Sorry for, for pushing a little bit the last question here uh, before we have the lunch break. And a very brief uh, response. Uh, yeah, quick question to Living uh, Zhang on the legal standing of SOEs uh, before arbitration. So you referred to the, uh, the the issue that they have to demonstrate some some commercial activities in order to have this legal standing. So I'd like to know, um, according to what kind of methodology, if any, tribunals can identify when a Chinese SOE performs either commercial activity or a state mission. What are the, the elements that can allow to, to discover that? Thank you. Um, well, I think that the uh, determination on the commerciality, the nature of the activities uh, in the also SOE uh, situation as to what I've mentioned is really uh, some cases, you know, uh, based on the uh, U.S. you know federal court decisions <coughs> as to uh, how to interpret the, um, the exception as the um, uh, sovereignty immunity uh, uh, under the Federal Sovereignty Immunity Act. That that's a domestic law discussion. So basically, I think that this is going to be uh, subject to various federal uh, common law cases, you know, to interpret. And um, uh, I wouldn't. I, I'm I'm not an expert in in those things, but I, I think that, that we probably can explore more deeply into those cases. Yeah. Yeah. I think this is the, the the rule is that it's a domestic law, di you know, discussion. Yeah. But I think that in the, in the situation where the cases which uh, the uh, this uh, Hong Kong court of first instance decide <coughs> rejecting the crown immunity uh, when the Chinese SOE is trying to use that as a defense is more fact specific that you know this uh, you know the um, the actually um, the, the the subject themselves to the to the uh, to the jurisdiction and secondly I think based on Hua Tianlun is based on the uh, control test that you know actually um, you know they are not really um, subject to the control of the central government and um, in the case uh, I forgot the name uh, the case is uh, the, the first case which uh, the uh, the Hong Kong uh, court of first instance reject the immunity is based on the letter of the uh, central government in Hong Kong Macau saying that the uh, China Coal Group is really independent, they are just handling things on, them on behalf of themselves. So that really, uh, that letter is becoming a fatal factor in the, the determination of the Hong Kong court, rejecting the uh, immunity defense. Well, thank you very much. Please join me uh, in uh, an applaud for our panel members. <laughs>